just like to thank Mobilize uh, Materialize for inviting me to speak on my experience of using um, 3D printed implants for reconstruction of um, major pelvic defects. So, as the chairman said, I'm an orthopedic surgeon and uh, been in Sheffield now since 91. Sheffield's um, a city in the north of England, Steel City. You see a fair amount of hip surgery. Um, training in Toronto, Hamburg, Vienna, and Nijmegen, basically focusing on um, infection management and how to reconstruct following um, major bone loss. Orthopedic surgeons are very simple chaps. Uh, we have some great talks today with some great images and um, nice fancy scans. Most of the time, we use simple plain x-rays because until recently, we couldn't use um, CT or, um, or MRI because the metal of the implant would create so much scatter that for years we've just relied on simple radiographs. It's only of late we've been using um, more CT and MR. So that's my disclosures, which is not relevant today. So it's a good 50 years now since the late Sir John Charnley uh, developed the modern hip. He had the concept of a low friction arthroplasty, which revolutionized the treatment of painful arthritic hips. Arthritis in those days were treated with some aspirin and a walking stick, and told to get on with it. But many people, you know, just awful lives. They couldn't work, they couldn't do social things. It was a disaster. But since of the advent of the um, hip surgery, patients' lives have been revolutionized. And um, three months following hip replacement, you should be back at work doing the things you missed out on over the last few years. The numbers of hip replacements performed worldwide have gone through the roof. Um, in England and Wales, we have the National Joint Register, which is now the biggest in the world with a number of cases in it. And in 2015, there was 98,000 primary hips done. In the States, there's no real register as such, but figures are estimated in 2010 approaching um, 350,000 primary joints. And it's a fantastic operation. And the Lancet in 2007 described total hip replacement as being the operation of the century. It just changed people, people's lives. But unfortunately, they don't all work. And some fail, some fail prematurely, some fail years down the line. And the common reasons are fracture, wear at the articulation, loosening, used because of wear debris, infection, and dislocation. And depending, depending upon where you are in the world, some of these complications are more common. Like in the US, dislocation is the most common complication, possibly due to quality of surgery. But with more primaries being done, the revision burden is probably increasing. And a recent publication said that after 10 years, the rate of revision is about 12%. Now, when it comes to revision surgery, either one component can fail, either the femoral component or the acetabular component, or they can both fail. But generally, the acetabulum tends to fail worse. Is it because of the bone anatomy of the um, acetabulum? Is it because of the biomechanics of the construct? Or is it because of the material used um, on that side of the joint? And it's probably a combination of all three. Now, the majority of cases, it's quite straightforward to reconstruct a failed hip. And you can use the standard uncemented cup, which is basically our workhorse for revision surgery. But in a very small number of cases, there is massive bone loss uh, in the pelvis. Um, on the right here, we can see the femoral components has actually gone through the acetabulum and is weighing into the pelvis. And these tend to be what's called preposterously grade 3B, which is the worst, or pelvic discontinuities. So these are the bad ones. And the standard techniques that have been used to date have a very high failure rate, but as you can see, the failure rate is early. I mean, what operation can you allow to happen where after three years, a third of your patients have been revised? And these are big centers, the Mayo Clinic, and Poposka in Chicago. So these are big surgeons and high complications. I don't think today we can accept those results and we need to look at new technologies to try and reconstruct 
uh, the pelvis so our patients can go back to life again. And the common theme for failure is instability. These implants cannot be securely fixed to the bone. There's no bone biology there. They just become loose. And when they become loose, they destroy more bone and make it more and more difficult. So here we are now, this is what we're going to talk about, the AMACE acetabular vision system. As you see there, it's a custom-made trabecular titanium implant, and it matches the anatomy of the bone deficient acetabulum. And with this, we can achieve stability of the hemipelvis. This is a simple orthopedic slide, not for this audience. That's what um, I tell the orthopedic surgeons what it's all about. But um, the scan and on the, the model, there's a defect and there's the implant on the model. And we'll come back to that um, later. So when I was first told about this, I was a bit skeptical because why would this work? Because already we've lost the best bone. We were designed to have the best bone around the acetabulum. As you can see this model here, a lot of it is gone. So how are we going to fix this implant uh, to the skeleton? Where are these screws going? Because on the outer side of your pelvis, you've got lots of muscle. But you look inside, there's some major red and blue pipes, arteries and veins. And you need to know where your screws, screws are going because if we hit these, then it's um, really bad news. So when you produce, have a CT scan and ask a mace to make you one of these, you get a individualized patient booklet. And we'll go through this page by page. But effectively, it shows on this scan, the existing implants, the available bone stock, both in terms of quality and quantity. You need some fine tuning of the bone, but more importantly, it tells you where to put your screws and what length. So we've just on a simple CT scan with some magic software materialize, um, they can literally sort of layer by layer go through um, the scan, showing the old um, prostheses, whether it be cement or plastic from the cup. And the attention to detail is amazing. You can see little micro fractures, all sorts of things, which on the scan are demonstrated on the models. And whilst the implant is very much a mirror image of the defect, there are some small areas where obviously they can't make it perfect. So what they do, they show you areas on your model which you get where you need to remove these extra bits of bone so you get a nice flush uh, positioning of the um, customized implant on the host bone. And this again, it shows the, where the good bone is. It's okay having bone there, but it's very poor quality. It won't hold a screw. So we need to know about the quality of the bone and also the quantity. And um, the green bone is the best bone, but there's not much green bone around. And what is good, I think, is that from doing your scan and sending it off, within six weeks, the implant comes back. Now, six weeks may seem a long time, but in terms of scheduling and planning patients for major surgery, it's not a long time at all. And that's, I think, a really big plus in the system. But more importantly, all these screw holes, and for these components, often you can place up to 20 screws, and it will tell you which screw, what length of screw, what type, be it be a cortical type screw or a cancel screw. And then with these um, patient specific drill guides, you know its direction to aim your drill. And knowing what's on the other side of the pelvis, this is very, very important. And I think what's good are the cases we've done to date is that the majority of these screw holes, you get good purchase. And that's very good. So here's an example. So as well as getting the actual sort of um, implant, they give you a model 
of the um, hemipelvis, which would be sterile. You take into theatre with you. And there's the model of the um, implant. So you can put the real implant on the model, or you can put the model on the real patient. So in theatre, you can constantly just check position, because in the booklet as well, it will show you where your implant needs to be. Because obviously, this implant we're putting in is based like a skeleton for your prosthesis. And this must be in the correct orientation. If it's pointing towards the floor, then it's not going to work. So it reproduces the patient's anatomy and the inclination of the natural acetabulum. So here we go on our real patient again. Um, here we see the prosthesis in, the specific drill guide for these screws going up to the ilium. And there's a drill and there's a screw going in. This is basically the shell, so it's just restoring the bone. So then we have to place an actual prosthesis inside here. On this occasion, it's what's called a dual mobility. And here's a post-operative x-ray um, of this patient. And we can see very long screws getting good purchase up into the ilium. And nobody would attempt that um, without those specific drill guides because a few degrees out, and can go through the um, pelvis and cause major trauma. So we've got a short video clip now um, of a patient who effectively had an infected replacement, which is trees in stages, and there's the implant in. So we'll get the video clip showing. The head is to the ceiling. There should be some sound. But there we're just pointing out the extent of the bone defect. That's it. So that in the left there, hand that is the actual model. To that. And my colleague here is so trying to cut the bony landmarks inside the acetabulum with those that. on the model. And, and in a second, like he will pull out these extra bits of bone and do the same on the native pelvis. Yeah. Just do a bit of so now with a nice sort of... We have very simple tools. We have hammers, chisels, these powerful things. We want to have minute microvascular instruments. That's it. Trial back. So there's the um, the trial to see how it fits. Because those flanges need to go on the iliab, on the ischium and the pubis. And there's the definitive implant. Don't worry, we'll keep filming. The show must go on. Yeah, he's a witch, isn't he? <laughs> and there's the implant going in. This is big hole surgery. Our previous speaker, very, you know, very precise, nice incision. Good plan, Rush. We've got a big slash on the leg already. The old ball, uh, ball spike. Yeah. And there we go. There's a drill guide. You have several drill guides, depending where the um, screws are going. These are one for the ilium one for the pubis, and one for the ischium. Jenny? Oh. Have they got in there? So screws up to sort of um, 45, 60 millimetres, yeah. length 4.5 millimetre diameter. So it's big sort of screws like you'd use at home on your DIY. And there we go. So, experience to date. We haven't done a lot of these because it's only used in a small minority of patients. But these patients are really disabled. So, although it's a minority, there's still a, a big role. So, these were the severe bone defects. These were Posky 3Bs or pelvic dissociations. In all six, we had excellent intraoperative fit of the implant and we had good screw fixation in the majority, if not all, of the screw holes. The x-rays to date, obviously short series, no obvious loosening. The patients are happy to date because it's stable. It's not moving about, they feel happy because the contract is stable. And I'm cautiously optimistic because we go back several slides, those big series by Berry 
and uh, Poposky were all failing at three years, a third failing at three years. So we can be optimistic. Other, pe other speakers, authors, similar numbers, a bit longer follow-up, again, early impressive results. Most recent publication from Holland, 12 patients, again, pretty good. Dislocation, not too surprising because these patients will also have soft tissue issues as well, having had multiple surgery. So the advantages of this system, it, the actual custom-made augment fills the bony defect. But also compared to the other systems, the flanges which go into the ilium, ischium and pubis are all contoured, so they sit smoothly on the bone. I think the biggest difference compared to other systems are these patient-specific drill guides. It gives you confidence where to fire your drills and screw placement. And again, in terms of function, this allows the new hip to go in at the correct centre of rotation. If it's not correct, your hip will dislocate. So that's a plus two. Disadvantages, people say, because of planning, and that last speaker says, you can't modify interoperatively, but to date, that's not been an issue. You're lying on fixation determined by the CT scan. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, because in the past, we used to guess. Time to manufacture, I think six weeks is very reasonable. You don't want this the following week. You've got to plan, you've got a busy schedule. The cost, currently, we're charged about 12,000 sterling. The comparison here is made with trabecular metal, which is the latest orthopedic um, material used for everything, but that's not cheap either. So there isn't much difference between a triflange component and modular reconstruction. So what's the future hold? I think it's a definite place for this implant because there's a high failure rate of other techniques. Not for the majority, a minority, but these are disabled patients who, if left behind, will be confined to a wheelchair. I think it's good because there's good science behind it. The surgery is quite complex. It's risky because you've got all these blood vessels nearby, so you need to be in a dedicated hip center where you receive tertiary referrals. And there won't be a lot of patients, because most of the time you can cope with vision surgery using standard implants. This is the you know, one to five percent that appear all the time. Some people say it ought to be shorter than six weeks, but I think that's a bit hard. And yes, we'd like the cost to go down, but that may not happen. So I think as a surgeon, when you face the patient who has an X-ray, something like this, in the past you would despair, but nowadays there's hope because we can reconstruct and get a good functioning outcome. Thank you very much.